Chapter Six of The Haunted Woman by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Judge appears on the scene. It was Tuesday afternoon. Marshall had returned to town. The weather had suddenly broken, and rain had fallen steadily since early morning. Mrs. Moore was in her room, while Isbel, rather reluctantly, took the opportunity of bringing her correspondence up to date, a task she cordially detested. Half a dozen laconic epistles, sealed and addressed in her large sprawling handwriting, already lay piled on the table, and now she was writing to Blanche, expressing her pleasure at the intimation that she and Roger proposed to spend the coming weekend at the Gondi. Blanche was her old school chum and dearest friend. It was she who had introduced her to Marshall, her husband Roger's younger brother. Consequently, she regarded the engagement as her own peculiar handiwork, though of course Isbel held different ideas on the subject, which she kept strictly to herself. Isbel, who was Isbel to all the rest of her circle, was Billy to Blanche and her husband. They lived at Hampstead and were fairly well off. A knock sounded at the door, and a visiting card for Mrs. Moore was handed in by the hotel hall boy. Isbel read the name in silent astonishment. Directing the boy to wait, she at once went to her aunt's room. Mr. Judge is here, she announced dryly, standing by the door. The older lady half got up, then lay down again. Where is he? Downstairs, presumably. Will you see him? Really? It's most unreasonable. He appears to imagine he's privileged to do whatever he pleases. What an impossible hour to call. Well, I shan't see him, that's all. You'd better ascertain what he wants, hadn't you? Shall I go down? You? Certainly not, child. Just send down word that I'm not at home, and if he has anything to say, he can write. Isbel smiled remonstratingly. I think perhaps I'd better go down. A pity you're not always so considerate. It's only common courtesy, after all. The poor man may have come to Brighton specially. Do as you please about it. Only bind me to nothing. Don't be absurd, aunt. How can I bind you? She went away. Mrs. Moore stared thoughtfully at the closed door, rubbed her eyes, and took up her book again. Where is the gentleman? demanded Isbel of the hall boy. In the lounge, madam. She accompanied him downstairs. It was not yet the tea hour, and the lounge was nearly deserted. Judge was sitting in a stiff attitude on a straight back chair near the door. Although his garments were suited to the weather, he looked exceedingly well groomed, and Isbel, contrary to her anticipation, was favourably struck. He appeared considerably younger than his reported age was short, wiry, and clean-looking, and altogether was a thoroughly good and dignified type of wealthy provincial Englishman. His clean-shaven face was sallowish. It possessed power and resolution, quite evidently derived from long practice in handling men. The eyes were grey, shrewd, and steady, and he wore no glasses. The boy briefly introduced him and disappeared. Judge rose and bowed gravely, waiting for her to speak first. Mrs. Moore, unfortunately, is engaged. I am her niece. He bowed again. May I ask your name? I am Miss Lomont. He scrutinised her person somewhat closely. Her rather full bosom was strongly suggested beneath her loose silk afternoon jumper. Her neck was bare. A long chain of amethyst beads hung from it as far as the waist, and with this chain she toyed all the time they stood talking. "'I happen to be in Brighton on other business,' he explained, in a pleasant, solemn voice, "'and thought to kill two birds with one stone. I'm sorry I've been unlucky. Perhaps you'll be kind enough to convey a message.' "'Of course. I shall be most pleased to.' You may possibly be aware that Mrs. Moore and I have been in indirect communication through Mr. Stokes regarding the sale of my property, Runhill Court. Naturally, I am aware. 
my aunt and i live together and always have done of course i was ignorant of that well miss lomond i'm sorry to have kept her waiting so long but at least i've been able to come to a decision after a very full consideration of the matter and looking at it from all sides i find it will not be for the present at all events quite advisable to dispose of the estate i shall confirm it in writing when i get back home but in the meantime no doubt you will intimate my decision to mrs moore a red blotch appeared suddenly in the centre of each of isbel's cheeks there was quite a long pause but this decision appears to me very strange she said at length in a scarcely audible voice in what respect she lost her head i understood from mr stokes that you were anxious to sell your house mr stokes was not authorised by me to make any such statement replied judge in a tone of extreme annoyance i have never at any time expressed anxiety to sell it was he who suggested the business and i made my reluctance clear from the very first there is no breach of faith in any shape or form there was a settee situated in a retired corner of the room and towards this she steered him without protest on his part they seated themselves isbel smoothed out her skirt and kept throwing nervous glances about her as though at a loss how to reopen the subject would it be rude to ask you why i mean she broke off in confusion why i don't wish to sell because my future movements are uncertain miss lomond there are substantial reasons against my taking up residence there again at the moment but later on i may wish to do so i see there was another awkward silence the end of which was marked by a bitter smile on isbel's face no doubt you are more accustomed to dealing with business men mr judge now what makes you say that this decision of yours is so blunt it's almost like a challenge a challenge i feel just as though i had received a slap on the face he fidgeted in his place i may have expressed myself rather abruptly but that was because i had no idea the matter was of any great importance to you ladies if i have unwittingly been the means of upsetting your plans i can only say i am very sorry but you remain stubborn my dear lady you hardly realise what you are asking i have lived in that house for eight years and it is associated with the happiest period of my life you have never even seen it and yet you are disappointed because i declined to give it up in your favour and you must remember that you ladies after all are total strangers to me but we're not asking for charity mr judge we would take the place at your figure even if it were a trifle unreasonable if you don't mean to live there again yourself and you seem very doubtful about it surely there can't be any object in refusing to allow other people to occupy it if you don't want to sell it outright you might consent to let it for a term of years judge smiled uneasily it is very painful for me to have to go on refusing i must admit i don't quite understand your eagerness in the matter not having seen runhill court you don't even know that it will suit your requirements we have seen it mr stokes took us over it will suit our requirements perfectly oh i had no idea mr stokes said nothing to me in his letter about that however there's no harm done my aunt and i are quite harmless persons i regard it as an honour to the house may i ask whether you saw the whole of it she imperceptibly drew a little nearer so that the perfume of her clothes began to insinuate itself into his consciousness except prohibited parts it's a pity i wasn't told beforehand miss lomond i could have shown you over personally their eyes chanced to meet isbel smiled and looked down at her lap while judge coloured faintly that would have been nice at all events you would have had the advantage of seeing the so-called prohibited parts as well i might still hold that out as an inducement for a second visit but i suspect you would not think it worth while she began biting her chain after a pause she said something might be arranged perhaps i should love to see it again my best friend's coming down for the weekend and i could bring her with me if you feel you could endure the society of a couple of frivolous girls for half a day 
you'd be quite safe mr judge blanche is married and i am to be soon your aunt would come too i haven't the slightest objection if you can persuade her i have first to meet her then dine with us here one night let me think friday would do if you can manage it she gave him a friendly look we can discuss the programme at table blanche's husband is mr stokes brother they are both coming down hesitating and blushing a little of course their company wouldn't be inflicted on you at runhill judge also hesitated it's most kind of you but how do i know that your aunt may not have objections to sitting down to table with a stranger who is not even obliging the invitation is mine mr judge then of course i shouldn't know how to refuse even if i wanted to a charming invitation demands a grateful acceptance i shall be delighted to come at seven but will you have to come all the way from town no my headquarters are at worthing for the time being i have to be near runhill to look after things i can quite easily run over then it's a fixed engagement and meanwhile you still remain adamant her own question seemed to agitate her for her bosom rose and fell judge summed her up in his mind as a spoilt and capricious young woman of fortune who was totally unaccustomed to being balked even in her most unnecessary whims it's exceedingly unpleasant for me miss lomont but i'm afraid i must reply in the affirmative if circumstances permit me later on to change my decision it would be too late in point of fact the moment my aunt has your verdict we shall leave brighton we are only waiting for that but i shall leave you to tell her yourself so as not to interfere with our little pleasure party then your permanent residence is not in brighton oh no judge contracted his brows it's a strange fact but it has always been my disappointing lot to fall in with really pleasant acquaintances just when it is too late it does seem to happen like that very often perhaps it's because the pleasure doesn't have time to wear off of course if you were to leave the question of your house in abeyance we might still see something of each other especially since you are staying so close at hand but that wouldn't be quite the right thing i expect mrs moore would hardly consent to postpone it indefinitely then that's no good anyhow don't write her mr judge she can very well wait till friday he got up to go isbel rose too and held out her hand it was white and elegant in shape but was ink-stained from her correspondence judge continued holding it while he went on talking i've no right to ask such a thing miss lomont but i'm interested and perhaps you won't mind telling me you said you are to be married is it by any chance to my friend mr stokes yes she coloured nervously and withdrew her hand thanks and may i venture to add my congratulations to those you have doubtless received from friends of longer standing he is a very pleasant sensible young fellow and from what i know of him will certainly make an admirable husband thank you mr judge my only fear is that i may not make as admirable a wife judge laughed courteously all i have to say to that is that i consider mr stokes a very lucky individual very lucky indeed isbel felt so strangely confused that she could not bring out another word they passed into the hall where judge with leisurely dignity put on his gloves and buttoned his coat while the girl watched him at last he bade her a smiling good day and went out stiffly through the swing doors into the rain she remained for a moment standing by the office looking after him with a peculiar little smile on arriving upstairs her aunt gave her a keen stare you've got very flushed very child i ran upstairs what a long time you've been with that man what did he want oh he's frantically long-winded the long and short of it is i've asked him to dinner on friday to meet you it seems he'd rather discuss it with you personally upon my soul why in the world should we dine him i had a presentiment you would do something silly oh he's perfectly presentable besides he'll be glad to meet marshall again i had to make some definite arrangements mrs moore growled in her throat well 
the point is are we to get the house or not i fancy he still hasn't made up his mind replied isbel indifferently her aunt made sundry inarticulate sounds indicative of her vexation and prepared to rise End of chapter six chapter seven of the haunted woman by david lindsay this librivox recording is in the public domain the dinner party at seven o'clock on friday evening the party of six sat down to a table in the public room judge found himself between the two girls while mrs moore had the two brothers for neighbours isbel faced marshall across the table and blanche her own husband blanche the tall pale slender fashionable blonde looked a creature of fine clay in her dinner frock of foam blue and silver she drew many glances from the other diners in the room and for a long time marshall and judge entered into a sort of competition for her favour isbel was amused rather than otherwise with regard to personal property there was a perfect understanding between her friend and herself and she had already earlier in the day intimated to blanche what her wishes were concerning judge while waiting for her to disentangle herself she occupied the time by chatting with roger on indifferent topics there could be nothing very exciting in that he was a nice man but she was quite well aware that for him only one woman in the world existed namely his own wife his profession was historical research fortunately he did not rely upon it for an income but as every one possesses a dual nature his favourite role in society was that of mephistopheles which he undertook consistently he was four years older than marshall and not unlike him in person though built on a small scale he had the same broad pugnacious good-humoured face but it was more humorous and sympathetic and the eyes were livelier isbel's new wine-red gown had the effect of investing her face with a strange luminous pallor which almost took the place of beauty at intervals judge turned to her in a puzzled way but blanche's fascinations were more obvious and the pear was not yet ripe it was not until the meal was halfway through and a few bottles had been emptied that the talk became loud and general mrs moore was fidgeting about runhill court and began to think that she would never have an opportunity of opening that business she could hardly start negotiations at table but she told herself that at least she ought to try to find out how things lay at the first lull in the conversation therefore she addressed judge directly by name and when he looked up rather surprised she introduced the subject of sherrop judge raised his brows i know who you mean but we've never met there has been some correspondence between us he was making the trip to england and wished to visit my place it seems his wife's people at one time owned the estate so he told us it was actually in your house that we met him thumping your piano incidentally added marshall judge shot him a glance of inquiry hammering out mendelssohn explained the underwriter it was one of beethoven's symphonies to be exact corrected isbel with a smile the seventh are you musical mr judge not very i fear you of course are but why of course am i so transparent a person roger tossed off a full glass of sauterne some women have accomplishments billy is one of the latter sort honey with a sting in it roger those of us who have no brains you are kind enough to console with fascination but perhaps i have neither or perhaps both suggested judge gallantly i for one see no reason why they should not go together many of the cleverest women in history have been the most fascinating but history has been written by men and men aren't the most enlightened critics where women are concerned all that will have to be rewritten by qualified feminine experts some day judge laughed but in point of fact men happen to be the best critics of feminine human nature 
a woman's natural impulse is to look for faults in her sisters a man's first thought is to look for noble qualities it may be very chivalrous but i don't call it criticism rejoined isbel quickly you're not in the least likely ever to understand a woman's character that way if faults constitute a character no but my contention is that it's this constant dwelling on faults which obscures our view of a woman's real underlying nature in this sense men are the best observers of your sex let me translate put in roger it's a good policy to credit a woman with virtues for if she hasn't got them already she will have as soon as she clearly understands that other people believe that she has does that go his wife answered if you praise a woman's frock she will probably like to go and wearing it why should it be different with a virtue because you haven't worn a thing for a long while it doesn't follow when you do wear it that it isn't your own rightful property then there are no counterfeit qualities demanded isbel none which cannot be easily detected to extend mrs stokes comparison a borrowed or stolen garment can in most cases be discovered to be so by the misfit in life it isn't difficult to distinguish between true and false does that apply to everything every quality undoubtedly in my opinion to the relation between men and women certainly genuine love for i take it you mean that would be the most difficult thing in the world to simulate really almost an impossibility if only men and women were not so anxious to be deceived yet coquettes have existed and still exist judge lifted his glass with a hand steady as a rock and examined its contents against the light meditatively don't misunderstand me miss lomont i don't assert that an infatuated man couldn't be hoodwinked by a clever woman if she made it her business all i say is if he is dubious about her good faith tests exist what tests a coquette for instance would know how to flatter his vanity and use her eyes to the best effect but it's extremely unlikely that she would consent to throw overboard all other society for his that would be one test and then there's the question of sacrifice is she not only ready but eager to sacrifice her own happiness for his not in one way or on one occasion but in all their relations and at all times most excellent tests said roger with twinkling eyes if fulfilled satisfactorily the fair lady in question might be safely set down as mortally wounded and our friend could go full steam ahead with every assurance of eventually leading her to the altar blanche leant her beautiful arm on the table and propped her face with her fingers but do you insist mr judge that every romance is imperfect which doesn't exhibit these extreme symptoms on both sides as a matter of fact i wasn't thinking of romance in the common acceptance of the term mrs stokes there are deep and possibly painful transactions of the heart to which the term romance would be quite inadequate there was a general silence while the waiter removed the course the subject was not resumed across the table but isbel followed it up with judge in a low voice you seem to speak from experience mr judge a man of my age must possess a large accumulation of experience miss lomont but it needn't necessarily be personal experience in that case you are to be congratulated for it can't be a happy condition this deep passion you've just described he toyed with the stem of his empty glass only certain natures have a capacity for it perhaps and they perhaps have an inward tormenting craving for it it's very difficult to lay down a law as to what is good and what is not good and i think women must have it more than men he glanced at her swiftly as the self-sacrificing sex you mean no i don't mean that i mean as the sex which worships the heart and believes it higher than the highest morality that's true and the worst of it is went on isbel speaking still lower no woman can feel really safe until she has experienced this feeling you speak of she uttered a nervous laugh someone else may turn up who will prove to her how mistakenly she has been living but of course i know nothing about it girls get all sorts of queer fancies in their head and that's because they don't live in the real world the wisest course is not to think about such things by a useful provision of nature passion comes to comparatively few 
and there's no reason for anyone to suppose that he or she is one of the tragic band. The chances are infinitely against it. Yes, of course. That's the only sensible way to think. I hope you're not offended by my breach of decorum in discussing such matters. How could I be? Then don't let's say any more. My aunt's watching us. Apropos, have you spoken to her about Runhill yet? I've had no real opportunity up to the present. Is it really necessary to this evening? Possibly not, if it could be avoided. Will you leave it to me? Willingly, but if she questions me, I must answer her. Of course, but don't be precipitate. A quick smile. I don't want to return to town yet. You find Brighton attractive? It has attractions. Judge's cream ice stood in front of him untouched. The place itself, or the connections you have formed here? The place itself is horrid. Meanwhile, Blanche had been exchanging words with Marshall. I want to get Mr. Judge to show us over his house. Myself and Roger, I mean. What's the best way to go to work? She did not explain that the idea was Isabel's, and she herself only the friendly medium. Ask him, of course, said Marshall. He's quite an obliging old sort. You go back on Monday, don't you? Yes, why? I thought we might fix Monday. You wouldn't want to see the place again, would you? I want Billy to come with us, though. I expect you wouldn't take it in bad part for once, running off like that without you, I mean. Lord, no, why should I? Very glad if you can make a decent day of it. I'd take lunch and make it a picnic if I were you. Good man. Then here goes for the Lord of the Manor. Judge, having concluded his talk with Isbel, had mechanically turned to his other neighbour. Blanche met his eye with a soft, disarming smile. I'm glad you've remembered me, Mr. Judge. I'm in a difficulty. That's woeful news. My husband and I are madly jealous. We're the only ones here who haven't seen your much-talked-about house. I daren't proffer a direct request for fear of being snubbed. You pay me a very bad compliment, Mrs. Stokes. I didn't quite know I possessed such a forbidding exterior. Then may we come for one day? I shall regard it as a distinguished honour. Pray fix your own day. We go back on Tuesday. Monday, perhaps. On Monday it shall be. I'll bring my car over for you. At what hour? But really, we wouldn't dream of putting you to all that trouble. It will be a very great pleasure. Unhappily, it's only a four-seater, so I fear the party would have to be separated. Mr. Stokes, Mr. Marshall Stokes, she laughed, can't come for the simple reason that he's due back at work on Monday. What about you, Mrs. Moore? I've seen the house already, my dear. Isbel will go with you, no doubt. Will you, Billy? Isbel appeared to hesitate. I don't know that I care to, thanks. I've seen it too, you know. Oh, I'd go, Isbel, urged Marshall. The summer's practically through, and you won't get many more decent spins. I'd squeeze in myself if I hadn't to go back. Mr. Judge may object to so many women. Surely you weren't waiting for my formal invitation, Miss Lomont. I shall feel extremely hurt if you refuse. Very well, I'll come, said Isbel quietly, bending her head over her plate with a very slight access of colour. Judge marvelled at her seeming reluctance to her own scheme but he somehow felt pleased. It was flattering to be behind the scenes with her. "'Then that's all right,' said Blanche. "'What time will you come and collect us, Mr. Judge?' "'You shall decide. I reserve the whole of Monday.' Isbel leant over in front of Judge to address her friend. "'You don't realise, dear, that he's staying at Worthing, ten miles away. We're all being deplorably inconsiderate.' Five miles per beauteous lady is not an extravagant addition to the petrol allowance. Roger had not spared the bottle. How say you, Judge? As you say, sir, it's not worth considering, especially when I have the pleasure of your society thrown in. Blanche's brow was puckered, as though an idea had occurred to her. I wonder, Mr. Judge, if it would be possible to arrange a picnic luncheon on the grounds, or the house itself, according to the weather. It would be rather jolly. The hotel people here would make us up a hamper. Not at all, said Judge. I'll see to that myself. It's a capital suggestion, for it will give us more time to look round. But really, that's the woman's department, and we can't allow you. I insist, Mrs. Stokes. I'm an obstinate man, and there's no more to be said. I'll bring the hamper along with me and call for you at ten, eleven. 
call it eleven said roger i am a late riser we'll lunch first and saunter through the house afterwards don't forget the wine the girl scolded him he defended himself with new jokes and drank off another glass the coffee came on the younger people lit cigarettes but judge reserved his after-dinner cigar till later mrs moore who had been silent throughout the meal grew more irritated as she saw the minutes fly by without bringing her any nearer to an exchange of views with judge she momentarily expected to see him rise from the table and take his departure leaving her still in ignorance of his intentions perhaps it wasn't deliberate avoidance of the topic on his part but it began to look very much like it isabel glanced at her aunt anxiously she read her thoughts with perfect distinctness you're very quiet to-night aunt you others are doing quite well without my help mr judge has asked me to intercede for him mrs moore stiffened what is it he wants another extension of time before giving you a final decision really mr judge it can't be helped aunt and we mustn't be stupid about it how long do you want mr judge shall we say a fortnight his manner was strangely embarrassed i may not need all of that if not i would notify you at once mrs moore eyed him sternly a fortnight then you quite understand my inquiries for a house are continuing in the meantime that is but fair a firm offer on my part wouldn't expedite matters i presume i regret to say no the financial question does not arise at present baffled by his formal tone and the distant gravity of his demeanour she retired into silence to nurse her displeasure isbel turned in her seat to glance at judge and uttered a quiet little laugh i am afraid you won't be altogether in her good graces now it's my fault since i have the misfortune to be obliged to displease one of you i would rather it were she i know that her voice was very low but he caught the words and his face took on a deeper colour how do you know it because we are already friends both turned away moved by the same impulse a minute later however isbel whispered to him again in case i ever need it what is your address at worthing the metropole she thanked him and turned finally to roger isbel seems to find a lot to talk about with judge marshall had just been remarking to his sister-in-law no cause for alarm dear boy she only wants his house you tell me she's deliberately laying herself out to be pleasant don't you ever use diplomacy in your trade one has to fight with what weapons one's got you're in on this too marshall i suppose you do want to get billy to yourself one day don't you well then hurry up and find mrs moore a house shortly afterward the party rose from table and judge immediately took his departure End of chapter 7chapter eight of the haunted woman by david lindsay this librivox recording is in the public domain the picnic at midday on monday judge's daimler pulled up outside the hall porch at runhill court roger jumped out and assisted the girls to alight after which judge himself got down beneath the motoring wraps blanche and isbel wore light summer dresses for although it was already october the sky was cloudless and the sun hot all congratulated themselves on the happy selection of such a day for their excursion where do we go laughed blanche judge was struggling to get out the baskets he deposited the second one on the ground and dusted his hands we are going to picnic in a very charming spot miss stokes leave it to me mr stokes as the younger man the bigger basket falls to you thanks how far is it come on said his wife never mind how far we'll all give a hand you and i will tackle the big one roger mr judge can take the smaller billy can carry the rug won't you leave your wraps though inquired judge it seems to me that once or twice i've caught a glimpse of something very enticing underneath the grass should be moderately dry 
"'You haven't forgotten the wine, Judge,' demanded Roger. "'If I work, I want pay. "'The girls' frocks leave me uninspired, "'more especially as my wife hasn't been settled for yet. "'I don't stir a step till I know what's in that basket.' "'This is a picnic, not an orgy,' said Blanche reprovingly. "'Judge lifted the smaller hamper. "'I saw the wine go in, and I believe it's very good stuff.' "'But you're a horrid sybarite, Roger,' put in Isbel. "'Why is it that strong and healthy young men are invariably the most self-indulgent?' She removed her wrap and flung it carelessly in the car. Blanche followed suit. "'I like that. You women pass your whole lives delighting your souls with fine raiment, and then you have the cool impudence to rebuke us for indulgence.' "'Personally, I regard feminine adornments not only as justifiable, but as a public duty,' remarked Judge. "'One can hardly say as much for the private pleasures of men.' Roger chuckled. "'If you carry on in that strain, you make yourself popular. Look at the girls drinking it all in with open mouths.' "'Mr. Judge is a knight,' said Isbel coldly. "'You are only a jester, Roger.' "'But is it good to be a knight, fair lady?' "'So it seems to my poor intelligence.' "'Tis a most dangerous profession. "'Your knight is a flatterer, "'but your flatterer may well end "'by becoming regarded as personal property. "'I shall remain a jester, I think.' "'They started off by Judge's direction "'along the terrace which skirted the front of the house. "'Blanche and Roger went on ahead, "'bearing the larger hamper between them, "'while Isbel and Judge fell behind.' the latter carrying the small basket. Isbel looked pensive. After a minute she said, "'That last remark of Roger's was as bitter as it was untrue. It makes out that we women are incapable of discriminating between personal and impersonal flattery. It isn't words that we go by. It's the man himself, his character.' "'I imagine so. But still, pleasant words lead to friendship.' "'Sometimes, perhaps,' the best kind of friendship's more than empty compliments and what do you understand by the best kind of friendship between persons of opposite sex she coloured faintly it is one of those things which are more easily known to oneself than defined for a friendship like that requires great tact and tact is not of the brain it is a very delicate instinct yes and that's why i'm so glad to have you for a friend mr judge for I feel certain that you possess this tact in the highest degree. However, it would make no difference. We shall soon see no more of each other. Can't we arrange to the contrary? How? We shall be leaving this part of the country almost directly, and you know we don't know the same people. It's extremely unlikely we shall ever meet again. In plain language, Miss Lomond, pardon me, I must speak openly. My house is the price of the continuance of your friendship. That is what you mean? The statement is yours, not mine. I don't presume to flatter myself that my humble acquaintance is worth more to you than your house. I should indeed be an egotist. You mustn't say that, Miss Lomond. My interests are very complicated. It isn't at all so simple as that. Please say no more at present. Of one thing you can be quite assured. I certainly do not wish to lose your friendship, and if it can in any way be arranged... Oh, it doesn't matter, said Isbel. Let me relieve you with that basket. They had reached the east end of the house. Blanche and Roger were standing waiting at the angle, ignorant which way to proceed. They had set down the hamper. Which way now? demanded Blanche. We'll change over, said Isbel. The men can take the big basket, and we'll bring up the rear. I'll have the other basket, Blanche, and you can carry the rug. Roger, with a groan, prepared to stoop again. "'Don't say it's far.' "'About two hundred yards,' replied Judge. "'The spot I have in mind is at the bottom of that field you see there.' Isbel was staring up at the house. She pointed a finger towards a gable. "'Isn't that the window of the East Room, Mr. Judge?' "'It is. But what makes you ask?' As she was about to reply, Blanche suddenly broke in. I didn't know the house had four stories. You said only three, Billy. There are only three. Four, darling. No, three. Count again. The men confirmed her statement. Blanche did count again, and now made it only three. She confessed her blunder, 
laughed and promptly allowed the incident to pass from her mind isbel stole a glance at judge who was thoughtfully stroking his chin while gazing at the house nothing more was said till they commenced the descent of the steeply sloping lawn the lower end of which adjoined the field judge and roger went ahead do you really think you saw four stories asked isbel with assumed carelessness yes i did why oh nothing what makes you so keen on that house billy i know it isn't only on your aunt's account isbel laughed you're developing into a very suspicious person what other motive could i possibly have considering the short time i should have to live there it isn't worth my while to get excited on my own account it's a quaint old place i admit have you got round mr judge yet not yet don't make poor old marshall too jealous that's all really you say the most weird things what do you imagine i'm doing you might give me credit for a small modicum of self-respect all right but men are strange animals the flash point is very low in some of them don't forget that they reached the bottom of the lawn and then had to cross a low stile into the field the descent continued but not so sharply the field lay fallow a fringe of elms bounded it on three sides while on the fourth was a wood towards which they made their way the sun blazed and the flies were troublesome roger looked back to point out to the girls some swallows which had not yet departed why should you think he's that sort of man demanded isbel eh my dear i've caught him looking rather strangely at you once or twice men are men and you can't make anything else of them he knows you're engaged of course my dear blanche well i won't say anything more you know best only do be very very careful isbel maintained an indignant silence until they neared the lower end of the field the men who had increased their distance kept glancing over their shoulders by way of protest against the girl's leisurely pace surely i'm not asking very much of him blanche if he doesn't want to live in the house himself he might just as well let us have it aunt will pay him his full price no doubt he's an excellent business man said blanche enigmatically they rejoined the others at the spot selected for lunch the rug was spread on the grass and the hampers were unpacked while roger busied himself with carving the pheasants and uncorking the hock the girls neatly set out rolls pastries fruit etc and judge made himself generally useful they lunched in full sunlight in the field by the side of a rather romantic little stream this brook separated them from the steeply ascending wood beyond and only an inch or so in depth was so beautifully transparent and flowed over its clean bed of pebbles with so musical a gurgle that isbel's spirits imperceptibly became tranquillized they were in the trough of two hillsides and the house was out of sight this licks friend omar i fancy said roger vigorously attacking his half bird for one flask of rotten syrup we have three bottles of the genuine stuff for a loaf of bread we have game and for thou we have two can't you compose a verse for the occasion judge i strongly protest against figuring in as a thou said isbel coolly those times are past for ever henceforward men are going to exist for us not we for them capital you have my fullest consent i haven't the faintest shadow of an objection to assisting to change a pretty woman's wilderness into a paradise choose forthright between judge and me this is the grave historian mr judge who spends his days in the dusty old reading-room at the british museum all the more justification for letting it go now my dear returned roger after long enforced spells of hobnobbing with kings heroes and politicians nature cries out for a little human intercourse with simple jane and pleasant muriel which of us is simple jane demanded isbel coldly simple jane is the one with the fewer ideas and pleasant muriel is the one with the greater number of smiles you can fight it out between you now leave me alone i am going to be busy mr judge are you going to let this unparalleled rudeness pass without rebuke judge threw out his hands what can i do dear lady 
he leaves nothing to catch hold of personally i think it's a very cunning device on his part to draw more smiles from both of you are you asserting that we are being dull asked blanche retaining her fork with its fragment of food in mid-air as she stared at him with wide eyes not dull certainly perhaps a shade more thoughtful than the occasion warrants i was wondering whether possibly i had said or done something to offend you how absurd exclaimed isbel you of all people guilty conscience billy said roger with his mouth full he's done something but isn't sure if it's been spotted out with it judge no no that doesn't arise since miss lomans assures me to the contrary it would be ungallant to carry the matter further coward why i offend billy on average once a fortnight throughout the year a capital creature but slightly hasty tempered you've never once upset me in your life my good man whenever you get beyond a certain level of offensiveness i can see only the funny side besides that's not the point we were discussing mr judge not you to be offended is to be disappointed and what right have i to be disappointed at anything mr judge may say or do seeing that i am practically unacquainted with his character blanche looked up sharply judge's face took on a deep flush as far as that goes he said after a moment's pause i don't know that i'm very different from what i seem that must mean you never do unexpected things everything proceeds with you according to your physiognomy you must be a very happy man mr judge and why should he do unexpected things asked roger the unexpected is sometimes charming but nearly always idiotic give me a man who can explain his actions afterwards yes i suppose that's the man's ideal it isn't the woman's we like men who obey the heart occasionally instead of the head it's stupid of course and we can't defend it but somehow that's the kind of men we should prefer to have for a friend and why because we women count generosity as a virtue roger roger drank and wiped his mouth then is an irresponsible person necessarily generous no but all i mean is we admire people who place friendship first self-interest second it appears that the fair billy doth know a thing or two isbel wriggled her shoulders impatiently i don't want gifts from friends but i do want friends who aren't afraid of giving surely that distinction is obvious quite what you are suffering from is acute romance such interesting persons no longer walk this hard cold world of ours if they have ever done so a man's best friend is his bank balance you may take that as an axiom i fully believe it isbel raised her glass to the level of her face so here's long life to money property and self and wine women and smiles and the blessed sunshine everything in short that makes life worth living and a ah, bah all metaphysical discussions between living men and women a special staff of professors has been retained by the world to deal with all that trash having emptied his glass at a gulp roger pulled out a cigar which he proceeded to cut and light with relish judge regarded him smilingly you never take things seriously mr stokes yes my work but after work i believe in play and no doubt you deserve it does he deserve it mrs stokes he works like a nigger i fancy answered blanche negligently it runs in the family his brother marshall's rapidly acquiring a fortune and roger is rapidly acquiring a reputation sometimes i feel i should like it to be the other way round so mr marshall stokes is really clever they tell me he's a sort of little napoleon in his way billy's a lucky girl whether she knows it or not and mr stokes is lucky too no 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 gamble about it at all a man is not a man till he gets married and if he's unhappy afterwards it's in all cases entirely his own fault look at mr roger stokes here he's thoroughly contented with life it's true he's been a trifle spoilt mr stokes your health you must come to all my future picnics if i'm fortunate enough to have any more if only for the sake of your high spirits then on the whole i've given greater satisfaction than the girls that i didn't say some things are outside praise as you know the glorious sun for example 
you're the wine of the party mr stokes while the ladies are the sunshine as the afternoon wore on isbel developed a headache she withdrew from the talk and kept glancing at her wrist watch it was nearing two o'clock you look pale billy said blanche at last my head aches a little everyone manifested sympathy they decided to pack up and go and meanwhile isbel was made to sit in the shade of the trees when finally they were ready to start for the house she found herself with empty hands walking beside judge may i speak or would you rather be quiet he asked after a few paces no please do it's about my house why do you want it so badly miss lomond she was silent for quite a long time perhaps it's your friendship i want and not your house ah but since when i don't know these feelings grow don't they yes but why my friendship how have i deserved this then perhaps it is your house i want after all really mr judge i know as little about this as you she lowered her tone of course you know you are an exceptional man you can understand it must be very flattering for a girl to be friends with such a man his face grew dark but he said nothing until they were nearing the stile where the others stood waiting for them then you have my permission to tell your aunt that she may have runhill court as an agreed figure i won't stand out any longer and this offer is unconditional yes unconditional you clearly understand oh i can't say it you need not try i clearly understand everything and the offer is entirely without conditions then i will accept it said isbel in a nearly inaudible voice End of chapter eight chapter nine of the haunted woman by david lindsay this librivox recording is in the public domain what happened in the second room as they trooped into the ancient strangely coloured hall their voices instinctively became lower and joking ceased blanche drew her friend aside it's a lovely place billy well did you speak to him again yes it's all right he's going to let us have it how did you manage it i didn't manage it at all the offer came from him really certainly why shouldn't it so now we shall live here i suppose congratulations my dear i expect you will have to see quite a lot of him after this you took that into consideration of course why do you dislike him so much i neither like nor dislike him i am only afraid you may have to pay a rather high price for your house that's all however it's your funeral blanche forthwith turned to judge to express her astonishment at the beauty of the hall it looked even weirder than usual by reason of the circumstance that the sun's rays now penetrated the windows obliquely so that one half of the place was in shadow judge responded to her with somewhat worried courtesy meanwhile isbel seated herself in a wicker chair with her back to the fireplace is the headache worse asked roger quietly and kindly it isn't any better roger as the others came up i wonder if you would all mind seeing the house without me i hate being a wet blanket what do you propose doing then asked blanche i'll stop here my head's going like an engine i've seen everything before except that one room judge reminded her still there's absolutely nothing to see there what room is that asked blanche a room on the top floor explained isbel supposed to be haunted isn't it mr judge i don't know where that information comes from i'm sure foolish tales may be told of it as of any other room blanche laughed a real live ghost mr judge i hope it's a classic example but i really know nothing about it how thrilling you'll take us there certainly if you wish it but first of all they decided to complete their inspection of the apartments on the ground floor isbel remained sitting while the others wandered about the hall 
the almost incessant drone of judge's voice as he explained his property detail by detail began to exercise a soporific effect upon her and she had a hard task to keep her eyes open she must have dozed for she awoke to consciousness with a start she was alone in the hall her friends were still somewhere on the lower floor she could hear their voices sounding from one of the rooms in the back of the house the words were indistinguishable but judge's rumbling tones were nearly continuous while blanche's high-pitched organ supplied an occasional punctuation she thought how singular it was that a woman's voice should always sound so absurdly shrill when heard from another room in conjunction with a man's she sat up sharply and rearranged her skirt without her being aware of the fact her foot was tapping the floor rapidly in nervous agitation before going upstairs they would have to return to the hall they might reappear at any moment and until they were safely away in the upper part of the house she dared not risk turning in her chair to see what was behind her if those stairs should already be there when shortly afterwards the door of the dining-room was thrown open and her friends re-entered the hall in a cluster bringing with them a clatter of conversation isbel smiled towards them but made no offer to rise aha she's awake exclaimed roger did you expect to find me asleep then you were slumbering beatifically when we left you we went out on tiptoes like a trio of conspirators endorse me judge well what do you think of it all blanche as far as you've seen it's a perfectly wonderful house so picturesque and quiet and so full of shadows won't you come over the rest with us now no thanks i'd better keep still i think judge pulled out a gold half hunter we shan't be a great while it's a quarter to three it ought not to take us above an hour i fancy you don't mind waiting that time no no only do go before departing roger lit a cigarette have one to pass the time away billy perhaps i will the first match went out and she reached her hand for the box i've seen steadier hands than yours remarked roger she passed back the box without a word retained the lighted cigarette in her mouth and suffered her hand to remain motionless on her lap blanche and judge were already at the foot of the staircase and roger hastened after them isbel gave a noiseless sigh smoking on nervously from her seat she could hear her friends debating on the upper landing where they should go first judge suggested the first floor apartments but blanche insisted on the haunted room apparently she gained her way for a minute later their footsteps sounded on the upper staircase leading to the top of the house their voices sank to a confused murmur which grew lower and lower until at last absolute silence reigned at the end of three minutes or so isbel rose suddenly overturning the chair in her vehemence her eyes swiftly fastened themselves on the wall next to the fireplace and then she gave a silent laugh of reaction for she at once realized how unnecessary her impatience had been not only was that staircase there directly confronting her but how could it help being there it was so manifestly solid and tangible it was so essential a part of the structure of the hall truly it was most puzzling that she had not noticed it on their entrance a short time ago and that none of the party had called attention to it but it was out of the question to go against the evidence of her senses the staircase was made of wood it had been constructed by human hands and it ascended to a different part of the same house there was nothing mystical or unnatural about it it was a straightforward piece of work intended for everyday use and in fact she had used it if she hadn't perfectly well remembered that she would certainly not have plotted and planned to be there that afternoon more minutes passed before she could bring herself to move covering her eyes with her hand she made a violent effort to recall what had taken place before 
it was both odd and exasperating that it should have so completely escaped her she distinctly recollected her impressions while standing with her foot on the first step but after that all was oblivion until she had been in the act of redescending into the hall what could possibly be the cause of this most unpleasant failure of memory perhaps the atmosphere of that upper part of the building was hypnotic that however would only be explaining one mystery by another for what kind of rooms could they be which had the effect of drugging the brain to permanent forgetfulness but perhaps she had dreamt it all and was still dreaming or she might be suffering from hallucinations suggested by judge's story she had never felt more sane wide awake or rational in her life the explanation could not be that time was creeping on she looked upwards towards the gallery and listened intently with held breath there was not a sound the others evidently were still on the top floor she stepped noiselessly across to the bottom of the staircase and began to ascend again the thrill of adventure seized her which she had experienced on the former occasion she felt that she was visiting an unknown region of the house where strange discoveries awaited her almost immediately she started to remember she could not recall everything at once but had to piece it together as one pieces together an old and buried event in one's career at the head of these stairs there should be an ante-room with three doors through one of these doors she had passed in the room beyond she had seen a wall mirror and a red curtain pushing past the curtain what had happened next she dimly recollected having descended more stairs having found herself once again in the hall it was all frightfully obscure and dark in the act of reconstructing her experience she paused frequently so deep was her abstraction that she was already standing quietly in the very ante-room she had recalled before she was fully conscious that she had reached it she looked up with a sudden start and gave a single rapid comprehensive glance around the apartment the three doors were there closed and forbidding as before the coloured light of the hall had given place to a sort of grey twilight it was all perfectly real to her senses yet she had a disquieting feeling that she was wandering in a dream-house where anything might happen the excitement which had so far sustained her now began to ebb and she grew frightened she had no intention of retreating but she liked the look of those doors less than ever how she had plucked up courage to open one of them on the last occasion she could not conceive it had been the left-hand one as it was useless to repeat that experience she ought really now to try the middle door if only she could bring herself to do so the other on the right she dismissed with a little emphatic shiver its appearance scared her she did not know why but merely to be standing in front of it was formidable she had an idea all the time that it was on the point of swinging solemnly open the headache had departed but her nerves were in a low condition she kept starting her heart was hammering away flush after flush came to her cheeks then a sudden panic possessed her she was sure that awful door was about to open she imagined that something was waiting just behind it preparing to glide out to intercept her from the stairs hardly knowing what she did she clutched the handle of the middle door it opened she passed in quickly and breathlessly and hurriedly closed it again from within she stood in a small wainscoted room unfurnished except for a carved wooden couch that was against the further wall the floor was bare and the walls were undecorated the apartment was duskily lighted from overhead since not a single side window existed notwithstanding its emptiness there was an atmosphere of stately opulence in the little chamber which could only be accounted for by the exquisiteness of its dark naked timber merely to be in it impressed her with a sense of personal dignity it was like entering the private cabinet of a nobleman she fancied that the presence of that solitary couch 
seemed to point to the rooms being primarily intended as a place for intimate meetings though that would be queer too she sat down but in an erect attitude and without relaxing her muscles she prepared herself to spring up suddenly again if need were in fact she felt far from easy in her mind to be sitting alone in that mysterious room behind a closed door which might at any minute be opened the situation was not precisely tranquillizing what was she waiting for and why did she not retire since she had seen all there was to see she asked herself the question and found no satisfactory reason for remaining but it was as if she were in a state of enchantment she continued sitting watching the door with nervous anxiety her sensitive fingers were playing time along the long delicate scarf she wore round her neck she dared not acknowledge to herself that she was waiting for that door to open and yet perhaps she was she uttered a faint cry and half rose from the couch the door was opening her terrified eyes met those of judge she got up altogether and stumbled towards him judge closed the door behind him quickly and quietly then coming up to her he supported her with his arm to the couch and both sat down isbel could not stare at him enough he seemed younger and different it might have been the effect of the dim light but it was too remarkable not to be noticed how have you got here she asked as soon as she could command her tongue he did not reply immediately but continued gazing at her with a sort of stern kindness his face was different it was less sallow less respectable more powerful and energetic and always younger he looked no more than five and forty i've come straight from the east room he said at last i mustn't stop the others are expecting me back i left them in the drawing-room while i returned to lock the east room and bring away the key i'd forgotten to do so when i got there a minute ago i saw the stairs and here i am but where are we in a strange place i fear i can't conceive how you have found your way up i came up from the hall what is that third door i've never ventured to enter perhaps some other time we will try it together we haven't leisure now isbel turned pale and removed herself a little away from him that's a strange thing to say you know it's impossible how do you regard this meeting then he eyed her gravely an accidental tell me is this really a part of the house or are we dreaming possibly neither i've been here many times in former years and i'm still no wiser than on the first occasion you may not be aware that in ten minutes time neither of us will remember a single detail of this meeting i know i also have been here before though not in this room then you have been deceiving me by force of necessity yes you could not have acted differently those stairs have an irresistible attraction i know the feeling and how everything else has to give way isbel still toyed with her scarf did you guess that i was practising a stratagem on you no it didn't occur to me although i did not altogether understand your anxiety to have the house now i've sunk hopelessly in your estimation no but you have succeeded in depressing me i dreamt of friendship and i wake up to find it's nothing of the sort she looked at him with a strange smile when you came in just now and found me sitting here what passed through your mind i was unaware that you were here as the result of a fixed purpose i thought it was your first visit and i presumed to imagine that fate had brought us together pardon my audacity and why do you suppose that your friendship is a matter of such indifference to me because you have used it as an instrument for your designs it is not a matter of indifference to me she said in a very low voice as everything is to be forgotten so soon there's no object in my concealing my true feelings there is such a thing as honour i am to marry another man and all my love is for him but though i can't and mustn't love you you have already influenced my life very strongly and i feel that you will go on doing so more and more i don't wish our friendship to die away on the contrary i wish it to become richer and more intimate 
i have deceived you in other things but not in that judge's manner appeared curiously humble if i have had some influence on your life you have inspired me to new life altogether before i met you i was a lost man i was wifeless and friendless i don't think i could go on without your friendship i am willing to pay higher prices than the one you've exacted they looked at each other in silence for a minute we shall understand each other better after this said isbel softly even if our minds forget something in us will remember perhaps but give me something to remember by after a moment's reflection isbel slowly unwound the silk scarf from her neck take this then he glanced at her before accepting it won't its absence be remarked it's mine to dispose of i think i'm not giving anything with it except respect and kindness judge held out his hand took the scarf and after carefully almost reverently folding it into small compass bestowed it in the breast pocket of his coat i shall guard it as the most precious of secrets i have an idea that we shall meet here again she shook her head doubtfully it's a fearful place i'm not sure that we have either of us done right to come here at all do you feel a worse woman for having spent these few minutes with me oh no no not worse but far far better i feel it's impossible to describe try i feel just as if i'd had a spiritual lesson it's foolish let me interpret for you isn't it your feeling that during the short time we have spent here together we have been enabled temporarily to drop the mask of convention and talk to each other more humanly and truthfully isn't this what you feel yes i think it is the air here seems very different it's nobler and there's a sort of music in it if it hadn't been for this strange meeting we should never have known each other so well perhaps not at all then we have done right to come here isbel got up and started walking about restlessly judge sat where he was with a face of stone presently she stopped short in front of him and demanded with quiet suddenness what can be waiting for us in that other room we must find out but not now i must go now but haven't you formed a guess i have somehow received the impression that this room and the left-hand one are merely lobbies to that other if we are to experience anything it will be there all this is only preliminary i think so too said isbel but i should never find the courage to enter that room alone we'll go together the same fortune which has brought us face to face here this afternoon will provide us with an opportunity he got to his feet so now we separate in order to meet again asked isbel a strangers unfortunately no she spoke with quiet dignity hearts which have once met can never be strangers i am sure we shall know each other they moved towards the door and as they did so the same idea occurred for the first time to both surely we couldn't both have come up the same flight of stairs asked isbel i know of only one way up we must have done but i came up from the hall and i only climbed to the height of one story we have to recognise i fear that physical properties here are different i have plagued my head sufficiently over all that i am not disposed to worry about it any longer we will go down together but i think we shall lose sight of each other on the stairs they passed through the door into the ante-room couldn't we put it to the test by my taking your arm queried isbel better not play with unknown forces i think he bowed and stood aside to allow her to precede him down the staircase halfway down she turned her head to see if he was still there following but he had disappeared End of chapter 9chapter ten of the haunted woman by david lindsay this librivox recording is in the public domain blanche speaks out the hall was as she had left it and her friends apparently had not yet returned 
Her head was bewildered. She was unable at first to realise what had happened to her. She knew that a staircase had appeared to her, that she had climbed it some little time ago, and that it was only this minute that she had come down again. But the stairs had vanished, and her memory concerning the adventure was an utter blank. Pressing her hand to her hot forehead, she stared earnestly at the wall, in the effort to concentrate her will on that one task of recollection. But it was quite useless. The experience, whatever it was, had grazed her mind as lightly as a dream. Yet it had now happened to her twice, and it had happened to Mr. Judge as well, in years gone by. She made up her mind to talk to that man on the subject. He was the only one to whom she could talk about it, and it was impossible to go on any longer hugging this awful secret in solitude. That would be the best. He might be angry at Marshall's breach of confidence, but perhaps it would be possible to contrive that that should not come out. She need not decide now. When she got home, she would think about it all carefully, weighing the affair in all its bearings. Her watch told her that it was close upon half-past three. It was evident that she had been somewhere all that time. Then suddenly she realised the absence of her scarf. Uttering an exclamation of annoyance, she quickly cast her eyes around for the missing article, but it was nowhere visible in the hall, and she had not been in any other part of the house. She concluded that she must have dropped it out of doors, perhaps where they had picnicked in that field. She did not value the scarf highly, but it was vexing to lose it so stupidly. It would not take long to run there and back before the others came downstairs again. Passing out of the hall door, she retraced their route to the place where they had lunched, keeping a sharp watch for the bright silken fabric which ought to catch the eye quickly enough. She covered the whole distance, only stopping short at the little stream, but failed to see it anywhere. Then, recollecting that Blanche might possibly have picked it up and taken charge of it, she returned more quietly to the house. The little distraction had at least one good result. It enabled her for a few minutes to forget that other thing, thereby permitting her nerves to tranquillise themselves, and in consequence she was now in a position to meet her friends again with tolerable coolness. On re-entering the hall, she found them waiting for her. They seemed to have just come down. Even before anyone spoke, Isbel was conscious of a changed atmosphere. An air of constraint hung over the little party, and for a moment she had a guilty feeling that this embarrassment was in some way connected with herself. No one remembered to inquire after the condition of her head. Blanche addressed her with a cold smile. "'We seem to be playing at hide-and-seek this afternoon. First, Mr. Judge loses himself, and then you. "'I'm exceedingly sorry. I missed my scarf and went outside to look for it. "'You haven't picked it up by any chance?' "'No. It doesn't matter, but it's gone. "'You haven't been upstairs, have you?' "'No. Oh, no. Why?' "'You needn't look so startled. I only meant that you had it round your neck when we went up.' It was the last thing I saw. Surely not, said Isbel, much puzzled. Were you in the hall all the time, up to the moment you missed it? Yes. Blanche shrugged her shoulders and turned away. Mrs. Stokes must be mistaken, and you must have dropped it out of doors, suggested Judge. I'll tell Priday to institute a thorough search for it. When found, I'll send it on. Thank you very much. Isbel kept stealing perplexed glances at Judge, and each time she did so she surprised him in the act of hastily averting his eyes from her. She could not imagine why they were regarding each other with such furtive interest. As far as she knew, nothing had changed in their relations since they had last spoken together, yet now it seemed as if they had a great deal to say to each other, which they had somehow failed to discover at the time. She wondered how she could get to speak to him again. "'How did Mr. Judge contrive to get lost, then?' she inquired of Roger, who appeared the most approachable of the trio. "'With perfect ease. 
Launch and I were wandering about the premises like Adam and Eve turned out of Eden for the space of half an hour. I can only repeat my apologies, said Judge rather stiffly. I admit it was a most unpardonable breach of courtesy. Isbel looked from one to the other. How did it come about, then? The explanation is not very much to my credit, Miss Lomont, but I fear I have no right to stand on dignity. We had come downstairs from the top story, after visiting the East Room, and were about to enter the drawing room, when I suddenly remembered that I had omitted to lock that other room again, which is to break my own rule. Mrs. Stokes was kind enough to allow me a couple of minutes' leave of absence to attend to the business. "'Which Mr. Judge promptly extended to half an hour,' said Blanche, with her back still turned. "'Why, what's happened?' "'A somewhat absurd accident, Miss Lomont. Whether it was the hot sun or the wine, I don't know. But I fell asleep upstairs.' "'How funny!' Isbel began to laugh. Blanche swung round. "'What the funniest thing was, that when we went upstairs to look for him, he was nowhere to be found.' i repeat mrs stokes because you looked in the wrong place i was in one of the servants rooms i recollected having seen a window left open and went along to shut it quite a chapter of accidents said isbel however the main thing is we're all happily assembled again safe and sound after our various adventures did you see anything interesting roger much the house is a veritable potpourri of styles and centuries I've counted three distinct periods, and perhaps there are more. Judge entered the conversation with a visible effort. The hall is one, the main body of the house is another, but what is the third? Why, the East Room. There's old, old, very old work there, unless I'm crassly ignorant. One of the rafters of the ceiling is carved with runes. That was placed there by no Elizabethan hand. You said nothing about this at the time? i had no audience my dear proprietor my lady wife was gazing around for ghosts while you were deep in abstract thought and did not once remove your eyes from the blank wall they chanced to alight on but what would be the object of this carving demanded isbel hurriedly doubtless a magic formula employed by our heathen saxon forefathers to prevent the goblins from riding the roof a favourite supernatural pastime of the olden days were i judge i would fain remove the timber and send it to our authorities to be deciphered perhaps i will said judge isbel did not listen to roger very attentively she was cogitating judge's story she did not believe that he had spoken the truth a quite different explanation of his disappearance had dawned on her and with isbel's intuitions from dawn to full day was but a flash on his return to the east room he had seen that staircase again which he had seen so many times before he had ascended it and her heart beat rapidly they too had met up there that was why they had been glancing at each other so strangely she was as sure of it all as if she had heard it from his own mouth she turned aside in sick excitement we'd better get home remarked blanche coldly it's nearly four and i shan't be sorry for some tea judge glanced at her rather anxiously would you prefer to stop somewhere en route we'll get home i think as there was nothing to wait for they at once left the hall the girls went in front but as soon as they were outside blanche accompanied her husband to the car leaving the others on the doorstep while judge prepared to lock up i'm coming over to worthing to-morrow to see you murmured isabel standing straight up facing the door and judge without changing countenance or so much as looking at her he bent down to insert the key in the hole certainly miss lomont i'll come over by train in the morning can you meet me on the front as if by accident do you know a train there's the ten forty from hove that will do please don't say a word to any one without waiting for his response she hastened to join her friends the two girls resumed their wraps and got into the back seat judge took his place behind the wheel and lastly roger climbed in after a little preliminary backing they made a clear start down the drive 
at the lodge gate they stopped for a minute while mrs priday called her husband out in obedience to judge's request the head gardener was in the middle of tea and his mouth was still busily engaged in spite of his efforts to empty it priday said his master leaning out of the car towards him one of the ladies has lost a scarf somewhere on the grounds it might be as far away as the stream by moss's wood have a good look round for it to-day it must be found Collar, sir judge mutely transferred the inquiry to isbel Vieux rose a long silk scarf pink priday see to it at once good afternoon blanche paid a visit to isbel's room that evening during the dressing hour before dinner isbel fully gowned was sitting on a sofa reading a magazine blanche had on the frock which she had worn on the occasion of the dinner party she refused to sit down and altogether seemed rather unusual in her manner isbel being in a highly sensitive mood detected the presence of feminine electricity at once she quietly set down her paper beside her feeling more apprehension than she cared to admit to herself what's the matter blanche nothing i've just looked in i thought perhaps you wanted to say something well have you enjoyed your day oh i expect so have you yes but i'm vexed about the scarf blanche pointed her toes together and gazed down at the carpet is it worth worrying about i hate losing things there was a pause i know where it is if that's any help to you said blanche quietly you do why where is it her friend slowly lifted her eyes until they stopped on isbel's face in judge's breast pocket isbel jumped up then sat down again what that's where it was dear at any rate for i saw it there peeping out oh absurd what on earth should he be doing with my scarf i wonder you don't rather ask how it comes to be in his possession you didn't give it to him i presume i decidedly didn't i'm not in the habit of giving articles of clothing to men blanche pursed her lips for a second or two you certainly were wearing it when we went upstairs you never came upstairs at all and judge never went downstairs yet the next time we meet him it has become mysteriously transferred to his pocket he hadn't even taken common precautions to hide it somewhat puzzling don't you think danger signals appeared suddenly on isbel's cheeks you infer nothing dearest but if you're speaking the truth as i hope for your own sake you are then that man isn't in any case he isn't a girl's scarf doesn't float upstairs and find its way into a man's pocket of its own sweet will most likely it wasn't my scarf at all my dear child whatever else i don't know i do know the contents of your wardrobe you might put roger off with that suggestion but not me it was your scarf isbel bit her lip and stared at the carpets beneath her then all i can say is he must be pretty far gone he has no right to it and i don't know in the least what he's doing with it perhaps it's a form of mania with him yes but you won't see the point how did he get hold of it i expect after he had made his escape from you he slipped quietly down the servant's staircase and got into the hall that way finding me asleep he appropriated the scarf i can't think of any other solution he may be a lunatic of course said blanche in her driest tone thanks i quite understand what you're driving at all along blanche said nothing isbel after waiting in vain for her to speak uttered a high metallic laugh oh i admit the evidence is overwhelmingly damning against both of us you might as well be honest about it for heaven's sake don't take up that tone you must see for yourself how it compromises you instead of losing your temper you had much better set about recovering your property if i've seen it somebody else may from which i assume that you don't propose to acquaint the others with the details of this romantic affair i am not a sneak you ought to know me better than that isbel gnawed away at her finger-nails i came here to try and help you went on blanche it's not very encouraging to find myself treated as an interfering busybody oh don't imagine i'm not grateful to you 
it isn't every one who would undertake such an unpalatable duty i quite see that perhaps i should have been even more grateful to you for a little loyal backing up but i see your point of view perfectly i've no right to expect other people to behave as quixotically as i should have done under similar circumstances every woman must act according to her nature it will be time enough to show sympathy when i know it's wanted and deserved don't spare me i beg blanche sat down slowly on the sofa after a minute she impulsively seized her friend's hand billy swear there's nothing between you and that man and i'll believe you i don't think you could tell me a direct lie up to the present we've always shared each other's secrets i do swear that i haven't the faintest notion how that scarf got out of my possession or into his i am as utterly mystified as you are sure quite sure said isabel colouring and smiling very well that's all i wanted to hear as long as it's all right on your side his conduct is of quite secondary importance i'm more relieved than i can tell you but you'll have to get it back by fair means or foul i'll think it over to-night in bed blanche gazed at her steadily still holding her hand if i were you i should drop the acquaintance altogether you won't derive much good from a man like that you mean give up the idea of his house there are plenty of other houses have you told your aunt yet about this change of decision no that's good don't dash a line off to judge to say it's all over and you could mention about the scarf at the same time say you understand it's in his possession and beg him to return it at once you could almost do it now before dinner no there isn't time replied isbel and she found no time the whole of the evening in bed the same night she tossed for hours tormenting her brain over the events of the day as often as she had satisfactorily assured herself of the impossibility of her having given that scarf personally to judge the whole problem would break open again like a badly bandaged wound and she would find herself once more searching in vain in all directions for some escape from the necessity of accepting this awful unthinkable hypothesis her thoughts travelled round and round in circles and relief came to her at last only in absolute physical exhaustion end of chapter ten chapter eleven of the haunted woman by david lindsay this librivox recording is in the public domain isbel visits worthing immediately after the departure of blanche and roger next morning isbel attired in an old though still serviceable tweed walking costume with stout low-heeled shoes announced her intention of taking a long tramp on the downs by herself she might or might not be back for lunch it was the only programme she could think of in which her aunt would be certain not to offer to participate mrs moor of course raised some half-hearted objections that was more in the nature of a ritual between the two ladies but in the end isbel got her way and before ten o'clock she was out of the hotel not en route to the downs however at the top of preston street she caught a bus to hove station and on arriving there purchased a ticket to worthing the train was a little overdue not many people were travelling and she was able to secure an empty first-class compartment her first action was to fling down both windows for the atmosphere was suffocating close it was one of those heavy sluggish overcast depressing mornings which are the sure forerunners of steady rain as they ran into worthing a few spots already began to gather on the left-hand side windows she found judge waiting for her at the parade end of south street he was smartly clad had his hands behind him and was gazing idly yet with dignity at the outside shelves of a book dealer's shop no one could have guessed from his manner that he was there by appointment when she touched him lightly on the arm his start of surprise nearly deceived herself into imagining that the meeting was accidental but then she remembered her own caution to him i 
and one you're waiting for i hope she asked with a smile he replaced his hat i would have come to the station but your instructions were definite then let's get on to the front it's going to rain isn't it i fear so and you have no protection i've nothing on to spoil they crossed the road to the parade and started to walk in the direction of the burlington there were a few people abroad and certainly no one she knew yet the mere fact that she was in a strange town strolling with a strange man had a peculiarly exciting effect upon her nerves everyone they passed seemed to be regarding her with suspicion you didn't mind meeting me here this morning mr judge just the reverse miss lomont i regard it as a great honour it's nothing very dreadful i just wanted to talk things over i quite understand but he looked rather puzzled she waited till some approaching women had met and passed first of all mr judge did you find my scarf yes it's in my pocket and you shall have it when we separate i've made a small parcel of it where was it found then he hesitated in a very queer resting place i'm afraid on getting home last evening i found it reposing neatly folded in my breast pocket i see doubtless a practical joke on someone's part a kind of joke i must admit i don't much care about you mean roger i suppose i don't think he would have done it couldn't you have placed it there yourself in a fit of abstraction no oh, that is entirely out of the question i think we must call it a joke there was an interval of silence and then she turned to him quietly mr judge yes miss lomont when you disappeared yesterday afternoon where were you surely i have explained that i don't blame you for giving an untrue account of your movements because of course you had to say something but you'll tell me the truth now won't you but really you did go up those stairs didn't you judge gave her a swift sidelong glance what stairs that strange staircase leading out of the east room mr marshall stokes told you then please leave him out of it my information is first hand it now came on to rain more sharply and they were forced to take refuge in an adjacent shelter which luckily proved to be vacant they sat facing the sea judge rested both hands on his gold-headed stick and stared straight before him yet i distinctly gathered that you have never personally visited that room miss lomont nor have i your house has more mysteries than you are aware of mr judge the hall also has its staircase what staircase he frowned i don't quite know how to take this not only have i seen it with my own eyes but i have twice set foot on it once being yesterday afternoon i want you to believe that i am being quite serious and not fabricating in the least yesterday afternoon five minutes after you had all gone upstairs could you describe them those stairs they were plain narrow wooden stairs going up through an opening in the wall no handrail the top was out of sight this is indeed extraordinary can you tell me your experience no for i remembered nothing of it but i went up them and came down again there was a long pause during which judge frequently cleared his throat i must believe you miss lomont and yet and this was the second occasion you tell me were you by yourself the first time as well yes i can't doubt your word the same thing has happened to me more than a few times astonishing as your statement is miss lomont in a sense i'm relieved by it i may as well confess it i have sometimes been alarmed for my reason the stable laws of nature are the foundation of the whole of our experience and when once in a while we seem to see them no longer valid it is inevitable that we should prefer to suspect our understanding then you did go up yesterday yes i did go up and remember nothing nothing whatever nothing that strikes you by it's not we have met in that upper part of the house judge looked up quickly what makes you think that you don't realize that it might explain my scarfs being in your possession she asked in a very low voice your scarf don't be in a hurry think it over for a minute mr judge it's important 
i cannot see how our meeting there or anywhere else would account for your scarfs being in my pocket if you cannot see i cannot help you i am not a thief and why should such a gift be made but perhaps it was made i cannot imagine what you mean said judge turning pale isbel cast uneasy glances around her she drew a little closer to him rearranging her skirt with nervous impatience that's the another thing i wanted to talk about mr judge i don't know how we really stand towards each other of course we're friends since yesterday our relationship has somehow seemed to me very undefined it has been worrying me i think i understand what you mean is it our experience in common or is it something else do try and help me it's frightfully difficult for me to speak of all this but is it necessary to miss lomond as you say we are friends perhaps if we show ourselves too curious we shall merely be robbing ourselves of what we already possess oh don't you see if we don't know how we stand we can't even be friends how can i have a man for a friend whose feelings i have to guess at i believe i'm justified in asking you i don't require you to commit yourself in any way and whatever you tell me i shan't take advantage of it but i think i ought to know just how it stands with you judge kept closing and opening his hand agitatedly we are really carrying the conversation too far miss lomond you must see that you and i have no right whatever to discuss feelings you don't or won't understand if you have feelings which refer to me they are my property and i have a perfect right to know what they are her voice quietened i must ask you tell me do you regard me in any special manner or can't you see how awkwardly i am situated till i know how we stand to each other she concluded weakly we are good friends miss lomond and nothing more so you persist in setting up this icy barrier but how can we go on meeting each other if our heads are to remain full of unsatisfied fancies and suspicions i promise you one thing mr judge if you decline to be my real friend you shan't be my friend at all i shall never want to see you again after this i shall be sorry for that but if everything is to finish so suddenly at least i prefer that it shall not be owing to an act of egregious folly on my part since i don't possess the advantages of a younger man i daren't imitate the rashness of one but what are you afraid of i can scarcely punish you for obeying me whatever you tell me i promise you it shan't bring our friendship to a close nothing will be changed except for the better won't you speak now i cannot she paled and began to tap the asphalt paving with her foot you can hardly refuse to answer a direct question am i anything to you at all mr judge perhaps you are a very great deal but the point is i can be nothing to you you mean exactly that yes i have a higher regard for you miss lomond than for any other living woman but what is implied by a very high regard she could scarcely breathe the words out there is a special term for that feeling but i am not permitted to pronounce it do i understand you correctly she asked nearly inaudibly judge made no reply after a long silence isbel gave a spasmodic wavering sigh shall i take my scarf now there's no one to see he produced the small brown paper packet from his pocket and passed it over to her she kept turning it in her hand with a sort of weary indifference what are we to do about it you know we must find out how it came to be in your possession i cannot go there again but you can if you wish me to but of what use is it if i'm to remember nothing could you not take pencil and paper that's an idea and i can't conceive why it has never occurred to me before very well then i will run over this afternoon but how shall i communicate the result to you i don't wish you either to write or call mr judge couldn't you manage to come over to brighton to-morrow afternoon and see me somewhere i must manage it where shall it be and at what time my aunt always takes her rest in the afternoon let's say three o'clock at the hove i think there are fewer people there to bother one you know the baths facing the sea 
yes outside there then you see the importance of this to both of us don't you my only motive in the business is to reassure your mind i draw no anticipations from the result isbel gave him a keen glance yet after what you have said it can't be a matter of indifference to you candidly miss lomont i don't wish for a result i want our friendship to continue and that will be impossible if i desire nothing more than we shall settle down again into the old pleasant state i feel confident that you will find we have foolishly allowed our imaginations to run away with us over this matter they had both risen to their feet but a heavier shower at that moment coming on they were compelled to seat themselves again isbel turned her head away and started fingering her hair by the way she announced suddenly i haven't mentioned your decision about the house yet to my aunt so you had better not either just as well not to i'm not sure at all after this that runhill will make a suitable residence for you for all that i may keep you to your word however we won't do anything in a hurry that woman will spoil her furs if she's not careful she referred to an elegantly garbed lady who was bearing down on their shelter from the west she was obviously flurried by the distressing rain as only a woman is flurried but her action remained perfectly graceful and fascinating to watch while she carried her furs and velvets as though they were a part of herself though tall and slender it was evident even at that distance that she had long since finished with girlhood but isbel was unable as yet to distinguish her features judge happened to be sitting on her other side so she failed to notice his embarrassment it's an acquaintance of mine he brought out somewhat quickly that is she is staying at the same hotel a mrs richborough a widow charming responded isbel vaguely i can't see her face is she pretty more distinguished looking than pretty a most interesting woman to talk to which is as far as my acquaintance extends a keen spiritualist yes i can see now she's got one of those white peaky faces is she well off i really can't say she has fashionable clothes and jewels i am merely on nodding terms with her she seems to be coming here i think i'll go no don't please miss lomond it will look too marked i'll just introduce you and you can take your departure immediately isbel bent her mouth into a scornful little smile as you please it's rather bad luck but anyway she won't know me from eve do tell me a train back i expect you have a timetable he had and produced it for consultation at once while he was hurriedly turning over the leaves mrs richborough advanced upon them with a quickened step and a sudden smile of recognition but somehow isbel had a suspicion that the meeting was not quite so unpremeditated all her poses were so accurately graceful and studied that the latter wondered if by any chance she could be a mannequin on holiday her heels were perfect stilts the face however when she came close up was a good thirty-six or seven and was not even decently pretty for that age it was long thin and pale with high cheekbones and a fixed insolent smile which expressed nothing at all except pretension but it was very beautifully made up so much so that it almost required another woman to see that it had been touched at all her whole toilette from clothes to perfume was based on an appeal to sex and men being such crude animals isbel thought that it was quite possible she might still pick up an occasional victim here or there she glanced down at her own shabby tweeds and smiled ironically may i come in out of the weather what a delight for the unexpected meeting mrs richborough without waiting for permission stepped under the shelter and shook out her muff judge still opening the open timetable in his hand rose with a courteous smile and removed his hat he continued standing it is indeed a pleasant surprise but aren't you terribly wet a little am i intruding her voice was quiet sweet almost to lusciousness and very leisurely each word was pronounced with a distinctness nearly theatrical but at the conclusion of all her periods she had the strange trick of dropping to a whisper not in the least replied judge 
we're cast up here by the rain and very thankful to see a new face this is a friend of mine miss lomont miss richborough i'm just in the act of looking up a train for miss lomont if you'll pardon me a minute mrs richborough sank lightly down next to isbel you aren't a worthing resident then oh no do i look like one i hardly know how one distinguishes them by appearance then you come from from brighton why the widow laughed i really can't say why i'm asking why does one ask these things so mr judge is in fortune's good graces this morning was yours accidental too my what i fear the rain won't have done your beautiful furs much good isn't it perfectly distressing and i so hoped it was to be fine you have been sensible at any rate you mean my get-up oh i put these on specially to come over here mrs richborough glanced at the little parcel on isbel's lap surely you didn't bring lunch with you oh no i'm only here on business judge at last succeeded in finding a train it would convey her to brighton in time for luncheon but she would have to start for the station at once and lose no time on the way mrs richborough held out her hand i hope we shall resume the acquaintance under more propitious circumstances isbel returned the slightest and coldest of bows deliberately overlooking the hand no don't trouble to come with me mr judge she said touching his fingers with a smile people who run for trains aren't very good company and i know the way quite well and she immediately set off through the rain in the direction of the railway station End of chapter 11